Good afternoon. This is Bob Birch with the Indiana Department of Workforce Development. Thanks for joining us. Today we have a very special program on appeals, and we are looking for administrative law judges, and we're going to get into some of those details shortly. Uh, I want to do a couple housekeeping items. We have a, a ton of people that signed up for today's program, and so I'm going to stall for just a second. We can see many of them logging on right now. So I will go over a couple of those items. Um, audio in the upper right-hand side, you'll see uh, an opportunity to use computer audio or phone audio. Uh, we know some of you are maybe mobile right now, but also if you're getting any kind of feedback, uh, that may be because uh, uh, there's another line open in your room, and so you may want to go on phone. So a couple different audio options for you. You'll see the dial-in numbers. Also, you're going to get a lot of information today, and there's going to be lots of questions. And so, first of all, you'll, you'll, this time tomorrow, you'll be getting a link to the recording. Today's program is getting recorded. And so not only those that are attending today live, but those that also registered and aren't able to make it, everyone will get a, a link tomorrow to that recording. So uh, lots of information. Don't worry. You'll get a copy of the recording, and then you can also share that with others if needed. So. Questions are a very important part of, uh, of a program like this. We have been doing virtual job fairs even pre-pandemic when we get together. You know, it's a big part of our commitment at DWD, getting employers and, and job seekers together. And uh, we've been doing these for quite a while. And uh, but now it's it's our turn. It's uh, it, it's coming. We're doing this for DWD and, and for the, the folks out there waiting appeals. So uh, send us your questions there on the upper right hand side. Uh, with the limited time we do have today, we won't be able to get to all of them, and I, I know lawyers, uh, uh, and they have questions, and so uh, those that we don't get to today, someone from the appeals team will um, uh, will get back to you. We got really a an outstanding lineup of, of people to talk with today to, to take into greater detail, but today doesn't happen without the work of, of Nate Feltman uh, with the IBJ and the Indiana Lawyer, and so here to... Uh, <laughs> Really, to, to kind of help welcome welcome you to the program, and, and uh, is Olivia Covington. Olivia is the editor of the Indiana Lawyer. Olivia, thanks again for all you guys do. Yes, thank you for having us. Thank you, DWD, for being a partner. Um, we just wanted to say on behalf of Indiana Lawyer and on behalf of Nate, who is our, our publisher and our CEO, that we are always happy to support the legal community, support efforts to give back to the legal community. So thank all of you for participating today. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Olivia, and please thanks, uh, pass our thanks along to Nate, because uh, uh, Nate, along with Commissioner Payne, DWD Commissioner Payne, are the ones that really made this happen, and, and Commissioner Payne has always uh, been quite a visionary in things like this. He's, he's always all in, and so I know that legal community, he holds very near and dear to his heart, so here's Commissioner Payne. Well, thanks, Bob, and I'm excited about this opportunity to have the legal community to uh, participate with us and to help. Uh, individuals in the state of Indiana moving forward. We all know that our country and our state and our people have gone through quite a lot uh, since March 2020. Practically every system that we had in place from health to IT to unemployment, all of those systems have been stretched. And fortunately, our IT infrastructure in Indiana uh, has held us up. Uh, back in March 2020, when we began to feel the effects of COVID-19 and our weekly unemployment claims jumped from 2,500 in one week up to 60,000, then up to 140,000 the next week, we knew that we would have to rely on a few things to make sure that we're able to deal with the volume. And that strategy that we relied on had us leaning into automation, technology, and people, or ATP. The balance was sh shift from time to time, um, but those three were and still remain the core of our strategy in dealing with the unprecedented number of unemployment claims. Now, just to put things in perspective a little bit, back in 2019, we paid about 82,000 individuals unemployment insurance benefits. The following year in 2020, we paid over 798,000 people of benefits. That number has since reached 875,000 through the month. Now, historically, our appeals would receive about, receive and resolve somewhere about 1,200 appeals in a year's time. Last year, we received about 61,000 and we resolved approximately 42,000. Because of that volume, we continue to lean into our strategy of ATP, specifically on the people side right now, this is where your willingness to lend your experience and skill will help us. 
For that, I sincerely thank you. And although there have been a ton of lessons that we've all learned throughout this pandemic, there's one that stands head and shoulders above the rest. That lesson is that we all need each other to get through this. So thank you for answering the call to assist us in handling unemployment insurance appeals. And with your help, we can assist more claimants to a resolution of, that map, of their matters. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Bob to make sure that we stay on target with the time we have allotted today. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Payne. And again, I think we've been very fortunate as an agency to have Commissioner Payne uh, leading this ship because certainly it was not anything that any of us could have planned for. And when we see some of the things that have happened around the country, uh, we've been very fortunate to have the leadership we have had here at DWD. Next up is Gina Ashley. Gina heads up our unemployment insurance division. And uh, it, again, throughout the pandemic, uh, Indiana has been one of those bright spots. And uh, and largely responsible for Gina and her team. And so, Gina, uh, if you can just take a minute and, uh, and maybe uh, talk a little bit about appeals and why we are here today and anything else you want to add. Sure. At first, I just want to start off by thanking everybody for participating today. Hopefully, at the end of this, some of you will decide that you are still interested and want to um, take the opportunity to join DWD and the work that we're doing. Um, I won't um, stay on long. Commissioner Payne really hit all of the um, critical points and sort of gave you a picture of what we've been dealing with over the last year. Um, Suzanne and Elaine will really do a deep dive into appeals and be able to hopefully answer most of your questions that you have today. Um, and again, I just really want to thank you for being present today. We do have um, a lot of work to do. We always have a lot of work to, to do here at the Department of Workforce Development um, and do have plenty of work to do in the appeals arena. And the work that is done by our administrative law judges really touched people's lives on a daily basis. Um, our job is to get it right, to make sure that we are following state and federal law, uh, applying that law, and then getting benefits to claimants who deserve those, um, and ensuring that employers um, are impacted correctly also. So we would love to have you come join us in the work that we do every day. And I'll turn it back to everybody. Thanks, Gina. And I think with that, I'm gonna throw a number out that I, I do whenever the opportunity exists. And, and throughout the pandemic, uh, DWD has paid 85% of initial claims, 85% of initial claims within 21 days or less, and the remaining 15% move on for additional investigation and eligibility. So important number to keep in mind, and that was the number that was pre-pandemic. So that, that number we were able, able to maintain. Gina and her team was able to keep the ship uh, on target at 85% throughout the pandemic. So. Uh, that was Gina Ashley. Next up, I think the first thing we're going to do is call a quick timeout and do a couple quick polling questions. We want to find out a little bit more about you. So uh, this helps our folks uh, that are be, that'll be doing the follow-up. So first polling question, Kaylee, I think uh, you'll see it. Are you a licensed attorney in the state of Indiana? So if you can select uh, one of the two, because this position will go into some greater detail in just a little bit, but this possession, this position uh, as a, a, a administrative law judge does require you to be a licensed attorney in the state of Indiana. Pretty simple. So that's why we have that up there. So uh, for those of you that don't, certainly are welcome to stay on board, but we do want to set this one up on uh, quickly. So another five seconds, Kaylee, and we'll take a real quick look at the results. And um, okay, that's what we were hoping for, 95%. So 95% of you are licensed uh, attorneys. So that's outstanding. And uh, uh, we're glad about that. Next, next one is, I think, a full and part-time. Okay, so this uh, this is really looking for, uh, are you looking for contract or slash part-time employment or a full-time role? Again, it just helps our recruiters. Uh, for those of you that, that are going to want follow-up, and we are going to ask that a, bit, a little bit later on in today's program. So, Kaylee, let's, I think I can guess the answer to this one. Let's see if I was correct. Yep, that's what I would have guessed, uh, even higher than I thought. So, okay, that's good. That's exactly uh, why we're here today. Uh, and, and that's good, very good news for all of us. So with that, let's get started. Let's get to the to meet of today's program. And uh, I'm gonna bring in Suzanne Manning. Suzanne Manning really kind of runs this, this whole ALJ and appeals program. And Suzanne, again, congratulations for you to you, the job you do. And if you can just uh, tell us real quickly background, and we knew th that because of these staggering numbers that both Gina and Commissioner Payne alluded to, everybody's got the right to appeal, and there are thousands and thousands of people that are denied payment or get into.
to a, an overpayment issue that results in an appeal. And that's, those numbers are not like they were a couple years ago, right? And so, and that, and, and because of the requirements of a licensed attorney, they have built and built. And I know your team is aggressively going after them for good, sound decisions. Anything else you can add about, about that and then whatever, sure. whatever else you want to get off and running with? Certainly. So thank you, Rob, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, yes, absolutely. Every single determination of eligibility that a claims investigator makes includes appeal rights. Um, so there's always initial um, eligibility determinations, and if a claimant is denied on an initial determination, um, they can appeal that. That comes before us, um, as well as um, any type of monetary determinations. Um, and then there might be other issues that arise during a claimant's claim for benefits. Um, they might have other issues that come up, um, and so there might be subsequent determinations um, that may affect their continuing eligibility. Uh, so for all of the, the, the many thousands of claimants that Fred was talking about that have been paid benefits, each and every single one of them has had at least two determinations of eligibility, a monetary determination and then an overall benefit determination. So that's already been done? Correct. Okay. So, but and as people continue to file for benefits, um, you know, there are continuing issues uh, that, that lead to the, the high volume of claims that, of appeals that we have at this time. Okay, let's, let's jump right in. So first and foremost, this is the Indiana Code that governs um, the fact that uh, ALJs uh, must be licensed attorneys to practice law in the state of Indiana. So this makes us unique. Um, not all states require ALJs to be licensed attorneys, the state of Indiana does. Um, and so there's a limited pool that we have. We can't just hire anyone off the street to do this job. Um, we do require you to be a licensed attorney. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit um, about um, the appeal work here. So we do have flexibility to work with attorneys, whether they are locally here uh, within the central Indianapolis area, they are located throughout the state of Indiana, or if they are located elsewhere. Um, so we have, um, with March 2020 dawning on us and sending everyone home, we had to quickly adjust to new working situations. And one of the areas that we've come up with is that we've had some virtual files. And so we have judges that work remotely 100% and work off of virtual files. Um, so there's no requirement for some of those folks to come into the office um, to have any physical files um, and everything is able to be done electronically uh, through the various different programs that we have. Um, if you are local and are interested, there's also opportunity for you to come in, um, have physical paper files. We can accommodate a lot of different things with this situation. Um, something else I just wanted to be um, upfront, this is a really fast paced work environment. Um, so one of the requirements that we ask for our judges is that for any hearing that they conduct during the week, that they issue the decision by end of the week. So any, any hearings that they've heard Monday through Friday, they issue by Friday. Yes. Suzanne, a question came in about the average, I, I know they vary, uh, but an average hearing would take how long? So scheduling wise, we roughly schedule the hearings for about 45 minutes. Depending upon the type of issue, it could be much shorter, somewhere around 15 minutes. If it's complex and it involves multiple parties, um, it might be more pushing the 45 minutes, maybe even a little bit more. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, um, we also are seeking folks that are comfortable writing findings of fact and conclusions of law. Elaine, did you have a question? I did not. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> just moving my glass. Okay, apologize. <laughs> um, all right. Um, but we do each each hearing that a judge conducts has to have findings of law and conclusions. I'm sorry, findings of fact and conclusions of law written on it. So every hearing requires that to be issued. Um, another area uh, to to share is that ALJs are not subject to the Code of Judicial Conduct um, here in the state of Indiana. So whether you are looking for contract or state employees, uh, ALJs do have to follow DWD policies and procedures. There will be training on that in the, in the program that will educate um, anyone on all of our policies and procedures. And then also to ensure that we meet um, quality in our decision, Department of Labor standards, we will have all initial decisions be reviewed by a member of management. Um, as Gina indicated at the outset, we want to make sure that the correct decision is being out that is being issued. So whether a claimant is, is properly due funds, we wanna make sure that they receive their, their unemployment benefits. Um, we need to make sure that the law is being applied correctly to the facts that are being presented. 
Another area of, uh, of, of interest to the state of Indiana, and this, uh, my memory has been lacking here, I want to say happened around 2016, 2017, I'm not sure if that's exactly correct, um, but the burden of proof was eliminated for unemployment insurance processes. Um, so this is quite different for normal practicing attorneys, you're used to practicing having a burden of proof. Um, in unemployment proceedings, there is no burden of proof. And there is a, a duty that we place upon our ALJs to help them develop the record. This is to make the process very pro se friendly, uh, to again, elicit and pull out the correct findings to make sure that we're getting to the correct and just decision for those claimants. Uh, one of the last areas that I wanted to touch on was confidentiality. Uh, pursuant to statute, uh, all of our hearings are confidential. So we are seeking out individuals that uh, would be able to, even if it's in a telework situation, be able to have a telework environment where they can, if they're having dealing with physical files, they can keep their physical files in a locked drawer. Uh, if they are dealing with virtual files, there are requirements and restrictions we have on what you're printing out, what you're not printing out. Um, but we do want to make sure that we protect claimants uh, and employers' confidentiality uh, when you're dealing with these decisions. Um, to touch on next, uh, next item here, they, we do have a clerical staff um, that will assist with processing and scheduling the appeals for you. So our ALJs provide their availability to their clerks and their clerk schedule based upon their availability. We do ask that judges um, enter their decisions and they are responsible for marking up their files. That includes whether it's a physical file or a virtual file. Um, and, and lastly, I just really want to hone in that each and every decision that our ALJs issue has a direct impact on Hoosiers. You are affecting Hoosiers immediately. If someone has been denied uh, benefits and you're reversing that eligibility, you're going to be, all of those back weeks, the vouchers are going to be paid out. And so if a claimant has been struggling, they're going to get those funds. Um, conversely, you might be reversing a decision which might be denying eligibility for a claimant. Um, so we do have a direct impact on claimants. Uh, we also have a direct input uh, impact on employers. Their tax liability is affected with how we proceed in our decisions and how ultimately they are taxed when claimants file for benefits. Well, thanks, Suzanne. I know that's a, that's a great summary of, of the program and some of the details of what it's all about. I know the next uh, slide we have just kind of summarizes uh, all of that, and so we wanted to kind of put that up uh, for everybody just to take a, a second to kind of have a quick review. Uh, thanks for going into some of that detail, and I know those that we've heard back from are, are very excited about this position. And as you mentioned, the word flexibility up there, I think that was a key word because some people like to work mornings, some people like to work afternoons, right? And so uh, all of that is, is can be very much tailored to uh, to somebody's schedule. And I know that's going to get uh, into a little more detail with, uh, uh, with Elaine in just a second. So next up, we're going to hear from a couple people. So next up, we're going to hear from uh, a, a team manager who's a DWD administrative law judge, uh, Asia Funderburg. And so uh, if we can get that queued up in just a second, we'll see if we can uh, hear from Asia. I came to the department in 2010 as an ALJ um, and heard cases primarily between claimants and employers regarding benefit eligibility. But not too long after doing that role, I moved up to the liability administrative law judge position, which is a different type of case law, body of law, wherein employers can challenge their liability um, for unemployment insurance contributions. Um, and I did that role for about five years or so. Um, and then I had resurfaced and come back to the department uh, in a different capacity, and now I'm a team manager. So now I manage other administrative law judges that do uh, benefit eligibility, and also now I've moved into managing administrative law judges who hear fraud cases um, and employer liability cases. So there's been a depth of experience that I've had here. Uh, it's great room for growth and improvement as an attorney here uh, with the department, particularly even just in the appeals department. One of the things that I love about this job is I'm able to look back on the week and say, I completed all of my work for the week and I'm done. And you move on to the next week. So it doesn't really carry over into uh, other weeks. 
So, you know, I think it's, it's a good job if you're looking to help people. It's a good job if you like to get in and get things accomplished. Um, and it's just a good position altogether. It's an interesting work, and, and the people that we work with are great, too. Working for the state of Indiana, and particularly the Department of Workforce Development as an ALJ, has been a really rewarding experience for me, um, and I'd recommend it for anyone else who may be interested. And that was Asia Funderburg. She is a, a DWD administrative law judge. Uh, and so uh, uh, next we're going to hear from someone that uh, many of you may uh, may recognize and know the name, Dave Remondini. I knew Dave back when he was with, uh, all the way back when he was a reporter with the Indiana Star. Dave went uh, on to law school and then worked for many, many years with the Indiana Supreme Court. So Dave is now working with us as a, a DWD administrative law judge. Let's hear from Dave about his experience. I think my role, most importantly, is to make sure, is to make sure that the case gets uh, processed correctly, that everyone's rights are respected and everyone gets a chance to uh, have their say and uh, a chance to make sure that everything that they need to get on the record is, is on the record and, and people uh, get the abil have the ability to see the process and understand how it works. You're able to solve problems and you're able to through the testimony and through the questions you ask and through the evidence, you're really able to see very often that a mistake was just flat out made. I think sometimes people see the issues as you're asking them the questions and by clearly writing the decisions that explain why you did what you did, it helps them understand the process and they feel at least they were heard and they now they know why they got the answer they did, whether it was positive or not. One of the nice things about it for me, uh, I'm semi-retired, uh, I worked at the uh, Indianapolis Star for 15 years as a reporter and then at the Supreme Court for 20 years and um, in those jobs it was nice to be part of a family and uh, and in this case you're you're joining another kind of family it's nice to be connected with a group again to be part of a team and so uh, if you've missed that this would be up this would be the opportunity to get back into that Okay, and that was Dave Remondini, and uh, I know that uh, many of you have already heard back uh, that, that know Dave, and so I, I know Dave very much enjoys what he's doing. Hey, let's move on. Next, we're gonna gonna touch on uh, another very, you know, some other important elements here, the training and recruiting, and for those interested, what are next steps? So we're gonna bring in Elaine Weller as part of this. Elaine is, uh, is our UI hiring project manager, as you can see, but she'll also be joined, uh, we're gonna have Suzanne also be part of this discussion. So uh, let's let's move on. Let's get them what they what they really need to know. Well, first of all, I want to say that I was super excited to see the uh, that there were some of you on here that are interested in full time employment. We do have full time employment positions available as a DWD state employee. Um, if you are not ready to commit to full time state employment, you can also be a contractor. And work hours with us as a full-time contractor. But if you want to be that state employee, I ask for you to um, do not pass go, do not email me, just go ahead and go to our website and apply online so you can go through our normal process. But if you would like to uh, work with us as a contract worker, please go ahead and email me. My team will then be sending you out a link for a Microsoft form, and it's going to gather some additional information so that we can see if this position is right for both of us. Um, some of those questions will ask about your uh, availability to work for us for 15 hours, but it will also ask if you are comfortable with computers, because like Suzanne said, you are going to be the individual that has to enter information into the computer. Um, if you are hired as a contract worker, you will be working with a vendor, so we will send your name onto the vendor. The vendor will contact you directly to do all of that background um, gathering that any position has when you're a new employee. They would then provide that information back to us so that we could reach out to you and get scheduling information. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more. But just to know, since you are a contract worker, you would be receiving no benefits. So if you needed a time off, you would um, just have to work that out on your own as that time would be unpaid. Uh, a big 
knowledge point is that this training is virtual, so you would be on Microsoft Teams, but it is uh, eight days in which we would need you to be present from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It is instructor-led and not on demand. So there may be times that you could re-watch a recording, but uh, unfortunately the whole training is not recorded, so you would need to be present from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It is not CLE credit eligible, but you would be paid for that training. And then um, the rate of pay is $26 an hour. And then we are looking for you to work a minimum of 15 hours, but you could work up to that 37 and a half, which is what our full-time hours are as a DWD employee. We're looking for you to work between 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. because those are our core hours as the agency. You will need to provide us um, your schedule for two weeks in advance, and that is because the um, clerical assistants, the administrative law judges, I'm sorry, administrative law clerks, they're going to be the ones scheduling your cases for you. Uh, we do plan to do interviews quickly, so if you are able to email me today, uh, fill out our sheet in which we'll give you an option to pick out um, certain blocks of times for July 26th, 27th, and 28th. Then we will send you a calendar invite. There is a link in that invite for you to click on to join once your interview time is um, set. And other than that, we are hoping to have a start date um, for August 16th for all of the contract positions. That would not be for the full-time DWD positions. Okay, so I have some questions that have come in. Anything else you need to add, Suzanne? Um, no, I think Elaine covered and hit most of the most of the important parts okay. there. Okay, we've got a lot of questions coming in here. Let's uh, let's jump right into those. And again, we're just about at our our, our stop time, but we we want to get to many of these as we can. How many cases will I be assigned? This is kind of a common theme. How many cases will I be assigned? And, and can you also tell us how cases are assigned? Sure, I'll go ahead and respond to that question. Um, so cases are assigned based upon judges' availability. So for our contract judges, we typically assign them one case per one hour. Um, state employees are treated somewhat differently um, for that aspect. Um, but if your availability is that you're working up to 15 hours, you probably would be scheduled somewhere in the neighborhood of 15. It may not be exactly 15. It would be dependent upon your availability. Um, and as Elaine mentioned, our clerical staff does schedule out cases in advance, which is, required, which is why we require to know your schedule ahead of time. It's fine to change that schedule if you had something come up and you can't work. If you normally said, I can work every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but that changes for one week, as long as you give us advance notice of that, we can work within those parameters. Um, and that's to comply to make sure that we're giving the parties uh, the required notice that they need uh, for the hearing. Okay, next question. Uh, what if I have to miss a portion of the training? You mentioned about the eight-day training and the need to be there. Some of the stuff is recorded. What if I have to miss some of that? So those kind of, it's very case by case, depending sure. upon when in the training that time is missed. Um, so as Elaine mentioned, there are portions that are recorded and we have been able to work with folks in the past if they've been able to um, watch that recorded portion later on in the evening. Um, we also do some mock hearings as a part of our training, and so depending upon the time that you're missing, if you're missing a portion of the mock hearing where perhaps maybe you're just writing the decision but you're not the participant, we have a little bit more flexibility to work with you on that. So it is a little bit more case-by-case -case basis, but we absolutely try to work with everyone to the best that we can um, because we want to bring as many people in as possible. Okay, I got a couple of questions about hours. Is there, you mentioned the, the hours per week minimum, is there an hours per day? Um, I don't think we've ever not, had that question before, but not a minimum hours per day. Um, so you don't have to work every day. No, you don't have to work every, every day. Um, okay. We do have some from both part-time state employees as well as contract employees that only work. Um, they work two days a week to fulfill the minimum of 15 hours. Um, we have some of them that break it up, and we have half days here and there. So okay. we're very flexible. Somebody that, uh, that's interested in full-time being a full-time ALJ, uh, the hours of that are they eight to five? That was a question. Generally, they are 8 to 4, depending upon whether or not you want to take a half-hour lunch or an hour lunch, it would be 8 to 4.30. We do have some flexibility 
The core hours remain that during training. Once you're out of training, we do have some flexibility. We have, you know, some folks like to start early and be in the office at seven. We have some late birds that don't want to roll in until nine. Um, and we do have some flexibility to work with that. Okay. Um, does each case go to a hearing? Yes. Every case that is scheduled will be scheduled for a hearing. Yes. Okay. On average, how much time is allowed for writing a decision? Estimate on that. So it just depends, um, and we um, we encourage judges during training to start writing um, their findings um, and their decision as soon as they're done. Um, the information is fresh in your head at that time, um, and our decisions um, are not lengthy for these types of issues. Uh, at most, I would say you know a, a decision of four pages would be long. You're looking at on average two to three pages, and considering that. Some of that is going to be your statutory authority or case law on it. Um, you know, your findings are really the bulk of the writing that you're doing, and then applying the statute and case law to your findings. Lots of good questions coming in. Or, or can the hearings be recorded? All of our hearings are, in fact, recorded, yes. Okay. And uh, a question, if you are working contract or if you're working uh, uh, part-time, are you paid for both the hearings and the time it takes to write the decisions? Yes. We don't break it out and and during your set for the for yes. the day. So if they say that they're working, you know, they want to work. Uh, if we have someone who wants to work on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we would schedule them hearings Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and expect the decision writing to occur during that time period. Which is why my example earlier, if someone is working 15 hours, they wouldn't have probably 15 cases. We would need to reduce that sum to allow for some decision writing time. We just heard from somebody; it's not going to be available during the three interview days. There's lots and lots of of opportunity here. So those people can stay in touch with you, Elaine, and, and there's going to be more opportunities yes. later. Um, I would definitely take your name and have it on another sheet. So if an opportunity arises for another training date, I would be able to contact you and set up different interview times. Okay. Um, And I think just on the volume, how many positions are available? I was kind of talking, will this last a while? If you can speak just a second to the volume, I mean, right now about, you know, how many people, and, and, and this isn't going to go away anytime soon, no matter how many people we get on board, right? Correct. Um, this is, you know, the, the reality is, is that there are a large number of people filing for unemployment insurance benefits. And as I mentioned, each and every single one of them receives, at a minimum, two determinations, a monetary determination of eligibility and then a benefit determination. Um, additionally, it, um, it's, it's been discussed um, as well in the news um, and it's been brought up at different areas that there is a high volume of fraud. Fraud also receives a determination if a claimant was falsifying information. So we have um, those determinations that will be looked at. Um, it, there is absolutely no shortage of, of work at this time. It would be lovely to say that there were, um, but um, you know the reality is, is that as Fred indicated, since March of 2020, the world has changed up on its end. And I think um, we are doing a fabulous job of processing everything that we can in a timely fashion. Um, but we uh, we need all hands on deck. Um, and so we thank everyone for helping out. And I know we, several of us, work uh, closely with other states in our same positions. And in Indiana, when it comes to appeals, do be aware that Indiana has done a tremendous job of, of handling their appeals in this workload. So a, a question on dates has come in. Training dates are July uh, 26, interview dates are yeah. July 26 through 28, uh, and then starting this particular group starting on August 16th. When are the, when's the training date? Uh, the training date would be August 16th. That would be the start date of the eight days. Okay. The, okay. So the positions for the start date, that's the start of the training date. Okay. There was mm -hmm. a question that came in on that. Um, <clears throat> how about what if I cannot hear a scheduled case because I am ill or is some other issue preventing me from conducting a scheduled hearing? How does that work? I'm sure it comes up. Sure. Um, that, that absolutely comes up. Um, from time to time, we have judges that are unable to hear a case uh, for a variety of reasons. And we have a process where we offer up that case and we have our clerical staff um, uh, essentially try to farm it out and ask for anybody if they have any time in their schedule to fit it in. So if perhaps um, uh, an appellant has chosen to withdraw and someone has an opening, then the judge that has that opening would be able to take that case and hear it for the originally scheduled judge. 
Well, I know we've hit our 30 minute mark and ran past it, so I'm going to keep you guys on if you can. There's still a lot of good questions coming in. Again, we won't be able to get to all of them today, but a question somebody comes in as a contractor part time, they really, really like it. The opportunity to switch to full time, I imagine, probably has happened, right? We have had in the past multiple individuals that started as a contract worker have shown um, their dedication, have been successful in what they are doing, and then we absolutely have been able to move them to full time and part time due to PD as well. Okay. Uh, can, and can we can you speak uh, to the technical requirements? I know I had a couple Mac questions. Uh, do we supply a laptop for those that need it? Uh, iOS based. Can, can uh, I know it's, it's secured cloud based, but uh, the technical requirements. I'll let Elaine answer most of that. <laughs> I was going to say so. Um, we would have you use your own equipment. We do not support Chromebooks or Mac. We do ask for you to be hardwired into your uh, internet source with an Ethernet cable, and then we provide you a virtual desktop. So everything would go through your computer. We teach you how to mask your phone number uh, because all of the hearings are telephonic. And so at that point, everything is on you, but we definitely provide you with support. Okay, another question on hours. Uh, are there any hours available after 4.30 or on weekends? So at this point in time, we are no longer doing hearings um, in the evenings or on Saturdays. Okay. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but any specific information that Elaine needs uh, from us besides our names and contact info if we're interested in contract work? I think that probably is yep. part of the right. follow-up. I was going to say that's all that I need because then I'll be able to gain the additional information from that survey I sent out. Okay. Uh, if anyone has taken retirement status, uh, uh, if anyone has taken re retirement status, are they eligible? I think this is going to the overall um, statute that requires you to be licensed in the state of Indiana. So the, okay. the Indiana Code is silent as to whether or not your license must be active or retired. Um, so we will take it at its literal interpretation. Okay. There's a couple questions about uh, in liability insurance, malpractice insurance. What can you speak to that? Um, can you, you I, need to follow I, up? I would probably need to follow up on that. Okay. And again, several of these in here, if we don't get to your question, again, uh, a lot of really good questions here. Uh, but I think uh, I got a couple more I want to make sure we get to here. Just one second. Uh, uh, what happens if a, uh, a scheduled case is canceled, dismissed, or withdrawn, and do you get paid at that time if you have a case that's scheduled that gets, gets done? How does that work? Um, absolutely. So if you are scheduled to hear a case at 2.30, but the um, claimant or appellant um, has withdrawn their case and it doesn't go forward, you would still be paid for that time. Um, and that would be, again, your agreed upon hours that you would set that you would provide us two weeks in advance. So it's not based upon your case the number, it's based upon the hours that you agree to work. Okay. Um, there's a, uh, several questions on help. Uh, you know, is there help out there? How do I communicate with my supervisor and or clerk? Uh, or, or am I kind of on my own? Oh, you're certainly not on your own, no. Um, we um, have a lot of help out there. Um, as Fred was mentioning earlier, our technology aspect, we uh, do a lot of our training through Microsoft Teams, which is why we're able to accommodate um, and be flexible with people that are not located here to central Indianapolis area. Um, so we have teams that you can reach out and chat with somebody on Teams. You can call someone on Microsoft Teams. You will be assigned a supervisor. That will be your direct supervisor. That would be your immediate go-to. But also in your training, you would be in a training cohort. So you get to know some of the other administrative law judges that are in your same training class. So even though you might be working virtual and remote um, from Florida, you would still have other judges that you would know in other areas. You can always reach out to them. If you have a question, you can reach out to your supervisor. Um, our supervisors are very collaborative. They work with one another. If, so if your team manager was not directly available, you could reach out to another team manager. Um, even in the remote settings, um, Microsoft Teams, phone, email, we've got lots of ways that you can get in contact with somebody and provide the help that you need. Okay, I know this is a word I always have trouble pronouncing, but is anonymity uh, of the ALJ protected from the parties? Do they know who you are when you're dealing with yeah, Pardon. so um, our notice of hearing does have the judge's names on it. Okay. Um, so that goes out to the parties. Um, now the confidentiality aspect that I spoke of earlier, um, we are required to keep the party's information confidential. 
Um, you know, if a party, you know, wants to disclose confidentiality information of something to someone else that's on their end, um, I don't think that there's any confidentiality aspect as to the judge's name. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, talking about picking up cases, um, occasionally you might pick up a case that wasn't originally scheduled to you, so you would just indicate on the record, this case is originally scheduled to Judge So-and-so, I'm Judge Manning, I will be picking up and conducting the case today. Um, we don't, there's never really been an issue um, with that. Um, all of our hearings are recorded. Parties do have the right to request a copy of the hearing recording if they want that, and the decision does go out with your name on it as well. Okay, another question. Uh, are there, are, is there a database of decisions that, that is kept that can be reviewed and learned from? So, yes, we do not ask that uh, new hires, new judges reinvent the wheel. We provide judges with a lot of training, Good. and um, some of that training is that um, our, our supervisors and management team takes a look at the issues and looks at the statute, see which statutes are applicable, and provides guidance so we can have that um, out there to share with our judges. Um, I would, uh, I, I love appeals. I love appeals work. And we, not only with the team managers, but I would say even with our judges, we're very collaborative. You can ask another judge, hey, I have this type of an issue. Have you ever written something similar that you'd be willing to share with me? Um, and, and judges are willing to do that. And we support each other and help each other. I think I know the answer to this one, but. Uh... Retired status, yes. Yes. Uh, inactive status, also yes. yes. And it's just a current licensed, uh, mm -hmm. active license, right? So, Correct. Uh, very much inactive. So uh, I think, um, again, there's a lot more for you and the team to follow up with. There are a lot more questions. And, and just kind of, a, 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 this is not a one-time, one-shot offer, right? I want to be clear. So because a lot of folks are interested in vacations, uh, will will there be an opportunity to come in, not necessarily now, but say in a month from now, will there be more training sessions, more chances for recruitment, et cetera? So I think I know the answer to that, but I always want to hear We are doing our best to make sure that we can, anyone that wants to come help us, we are finding a way for them to come help us. We okay. will do our best to, to try to make that happen. Elaine, you want to second that? I do agree. Okay. We do want you on board um, if it works for both of us. Okay, well, it, we have gone past our time, but again, thanks to all of you for some really great questions. And again, uh, uh, apologies for those we didn't get to, but uh, we will have the team uh, get back and between uh, Suzanne, Elaine, and, and the folks uh, that, that they work with, someone will get back to you very shortly with your questions, and thanks for that. So we do got to get closed up. So next steps would be to, um, you know, to, to, to reach out. You'll see that um, there's opportunity there on where to email and, and to send. Keep Elaine's email. We know her email box is lighting up. <laughs> and the, the quantity, we're looking for lots and lots of very good committed people. And again, there's a, a, a greater good to all of this as well. And so that's what I, I was convinced that when it comes to the lawyer community, as a special group, I was fortunate to spend several years working in the administration at Bingham here in town and then did consulting uh, with several folks I know that are that are on today's program and, and some wonderful people that we had registered for today and, and people just starting out what a great thing for a resume builder is to be an administrative law judge so you're just looking for the, the right folks for the right fit so with that let's get uh, let's get wrapped up thanks to everybody for your time again about this time tomorrow you'll be getting a uh, um, Oh, we, oh, I'm sorry. They, thanks for the reminder. We have a very important polling question we need to ask. And again, not bounding. There's no binding to this. Are you still interested? Would you like a follow-up? This will be for Elaine and her team to be able to uh, to get back to you personally, right? So there's other ways you can follow up is when you get the recording back. But this will give them a quick uh, a quick chance to say, hey, who's really interested? Who can we follow up with quickly? And then they can take you to the next step. So again, uh, let us know that, uh, again, if your mind changes, and uh, we're very open to that or very flexible with that as well. So with that, uh, just some final thank yous to, to Nate Feldman and, and Olivia, who was with us here today, Olivia Covington with the Indiana Lawyer. Again, without their support at the beginning, today does not happen. And so again, you guys have created an opportunity for so many folks and, 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 and claimants as well, and, and the greater good of all this. Certainly to Commissioner Payne, the uh, Indiana Lawyer, for all they do, the Indiana State Bar Association, the Indy Bar, and the IU Maurer School of Law. They helped us also. Uh, they stepped forward and, and has offered uh, offered to promote this. 
again, we far exceeded expectations of the number of people uh, that turned out. But again, knowing the, the legal community, they've always been behind good causes. And I think this is one to stay relevant uh, in the practice and practicing it, and again, for greater good. So with that, thanks again for your time and have a great day.